Um, for updates on the posting, you can check out our blog at rtgrlaw.com slash blog. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for COVID-19 and workers' comp, employer strategies to mitigate long-term risks. My name is Chantal Thomas, and I am a partner for RTGR Law in Southern California. As I mentioned, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted to our website in a few days. For updates, you can check out our blog at rtgrlaw.com slash blog. Um, that way, if anyone missed it, or if you'd like to refer back, you'll be able to view the video recording. A PDF version will also be available. Just email your local RTGR law office to request a copy. All the email addresses are here on the screen. If you're an adjuster and you would like CE credits or a CE certificate, you can just email your local office for that as well. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions. So please just enter your questions into the chat box on the bottom of the Zoom and you can direct it to me, Chantal Thomas or to everyone. And then we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter, Mr. Tom Richard. He's one of the founding partners of our firm. He's a master in workers comp and handling complex cases as well as the employment law overlap. He handles 132A, SNW claims, accommodation, fraud, civil subrogation, you name it, he does it. Um, so the information contained in this presentation is provided by RTGR Law for educational and informational purposes only. It is an abbreviated overview and should not be construed as legal advice on any subject matter, nor as a su substitute for legal services. Without further ado, here's Tom. Thank you, Chantal. <clears throat> everyone, I'm assuming everyone can hear me, excuse me. And thank you for joining us today for this um, uh, COVID-19 program. Um, a lot of us are, are looking uh, at the light at the end of the tunnel on COVID-19, thank God, uh, where vaccines are happening and, uh, uh, you know, hopefully workers' comp COVID claim count is going down uh, as, as that same uh, progress through our society occurs. But uh, what we're going to be really focusing on today are the long-term effects of COVID-19 cases because as we'll see, there have been a lot of COVID cases filed and there's a lot that continue to be filed. Hopefully many of those are, are minor, um, but some of them, as we'll talk about, will turn into much more than minor cases. And, and sometimes the extent of the uh, injury isn't known until further on in time, sometimes a long time. Um, and that's the kind of exposure we wanna to talk, to, uh, talk about today and, the, and how to contain that risk. Um, by just really being smart about how these cases are handled. So a little bit of COVID-19 claims data. Um, all states, including California with rebuttable presumptions uh, regarding COVID-19 tend to have a higher rate of COVID claims. So that's, that's really due in part to two things. One is the presumption uh, makes, makes it uh, so that more people who file those claims, the claims are accepted. But we're really talking about claims being filed, not just accepted based on a presumption. So I think the, this telegraphs is that the presumption themselves actually promote the filing of claims, at least according to this uh, nationwide data. 51% of all California workers' comp claims in December of 2020 were COVID claims. So if you think about that for a second, we're, what that means is that in December of 2020, um, basically knee injuries, elbow injuries, psych injuries, uh, you know, all workers' compensation claims that you could possibly think of normally count for 49% of the claims that were filed in December of 2020. The other 51% were all COVID-19 claims. So that's a lot of claims working their way through the workers' compensation system. Um, the denial rate for those COVID claims, however, decreased over time. And it was at almost 40% back in October. And as of January 2021, it was down to 25.4 percent. That's that's a pretty low denial rate for um, where 75 percent of these cases are being accepted. Um, and what we'll talk about is maybe that's part and due because the time frame to deny these claims is really short, or maybe employers don't think that there's a lot of risk on a COVID claim because many COVID uh, cases, fortunately, are minor. 
but uh, there is risk associated with these this is 75% acceptance rate uh, in the long run for employers and uh, insurers. So what's coming in California, this is, a, this is from the CWCI, and you'll see yeah, there was a big spike in December of 2020 uh, of COVID claims filed. So over time, you know, the, the, the COVID claims went up in 2020 all the way to December where they were really high. Um, they've come down a bit in 2021 as have case, COVID cases generally, but there continue, it continues to be a big part of workers' comp claims filed in California. So some of the COVID questions we're gonna to tackle today in the presentation, in addition to your questions at the end of the program, um, is can California's rebuttable presumption of COVID-19 actually be rebutted? And if so, how? Um, is the 25 plus or minus percent denial rate of COVID claims appropriate? Or should it be twice that amount or you know, substantially higher than that amount? And how do the OSHA regulations affect uh, the presumptions and the SB 685 notice law? This is important, especially with regard to the presumptions. Um, and we'll spend some time on talking about that, <clears throat> where the OSHA regulations may actually be helpful. And what about the adverse reactions to COVID-19 vaccines on the California workers comp? So here's our agenda. Um, we've talked about COVID claims data. Let's look at the, I'm sorry, I passed through that very quickly, but we'll go through vaccinations next. We'll do uh, can and should we deny COVID claims? Can and should we deny presumptive COVID claims? And what's, what's the language you use? Very basic. What's, what language should we communicate in those denial notices? We'll talk about the Cal OSHA regs and how they actually help in this claims, these claims decisions. Uh, briefly, we'll talk about the 685 notice requirement and then some employer liability issues uh, before we move on to questions. So talking about vaccines, what we're really talking about here is, is adverse reactions to vaccines. Um, and are adverse side effects to a COVID-19 vaccine covered by workers' compensation? Um, the short answer to that is an adverse or allergic reaction to COVID-19 vaccine given to an employee will likely be compensable under workers' comp if the vaccine was mandated by the employer um, and injected anywhere. So that could be on, at work, off work, you know, on the weekend, whatever. Or if it's not mandated by the employer, but optionally offered at the workplace. So some, for example, some medical providers are offering it at the workplace optionally for employees. Um, if it's on premises, it's likely covered by workers' compensation if that person has an adverse reaction or if the employer mandates it. And an example from case law is the St. Agnes Medical Center case where um, an employee suffered an adverse side effect from a flu shot that was found compensable where it was optionally offered by the medical center employer on site um, on, in part to benefit the employer because by having more and more employees vaccinated for the flu, um, this helped prevent the spread of flu within the hospital itself and therefore saved uh, uh, infection from patients and other employees. So it was to the benefit of the employer as well as the employee for that uh, optional vaccine to be taken. And when that employee suffered adverse side effects to that flu vaccine, it was found to be compensable. Um, what about vaccine paid leave? So let's say that, you're, that the employer doesn't mandate um, the vaccine or doesn't uh, offer it on site but does pay the employees to go uh, and get the vaccine as an encouragement or inducement or part of their wellness program. Um, an adverse allergic reaction to COVID-19 vaccine while off-duty, off-site may still be compensable under workers' comp um, if the employee is paid regular salary or wage um, to get, the, get vaccinated, even if the inoculation was optional. So if the uh, employees being paid their regular salary or their regular wage while they go offsite to get the vaccine as, as allowed by the employer, that's, that may be covered under workers' comp as well, um, as are generally things and tasks, tasks that employees do um, offsite while being paid. So for example, if you uh, pay an employee to run an errand for uh, the employer says, you know, we go out and get lunch for everybody and in the process of doing that, they're in a car accident, 
that's a covered workers' compensation claim if you're paying that employee to do that. Uh, or to, you know, so in this situation, it would probably be covered uh, as well. So what if the employee is provided uh, paid leave, such as an allowance to use sick leave or the use sick leave that's allowed under, um, under California law? The employers have a, a specific COVID vaccine leave pay that they, it's not a, it's not regular pay, but it's a special leave pay. Um, and that is a kind of an up in the air question. Um, so it's kind of an up in the air question as to whether employers should be offering this COVID vaccine leave pay. If they do, and the employee goes off and is paid while they're, get, while they're getting the vaccine, they have a negative reaction, it could be covered under workers' compensation. Um, the, the closer we get to the vaccine being mandatory, on site or paid, uh, the more likely an adverse reaction is covered by California Workers' Comp. This is just the current uh, FYI on when reporting for employers reporting COVID claims. Um, these are these are the uh, code numbers you use to report the claims. And now there's a, the second paragraph. You'll see there's now an ad for COVID adverse reaction code. Uh, for that. So it's not something that's going to happen or that they're anticipating to happen rarely. It's something that is happens enough that it needs its own code under the uh, reporting requirements for OSHA. Okay, let's that's so that's uh, the little short summary of COVID vaccine adverse reactions. Let's talk about these long tail COVID claims. Sometimes they're referred to as long haul COVID claims. And up on the screen is just a, a list of some of the, or some, some bubbles with some of the long-term COVID consequences that people are reporting. This is what uh, all across the country, people really, maybe all across the world, people have reported for those who experience long haul or long-term COVID uh, problems. And it's a whole bunch of different, um, it's basically everything you would read about on WebMD as a, as a symptom <laughs> it comes up as a long-term COVID um, consequence. So what is a, what is a COVID long tail claim? Uh, the New York Times reported that many long COVID, as they called it, patients had little or no symptoms from their initial infection. So these minor COVID claims that often starting just from a positive test result with no symptoms may be initially accepted by the employer or claims departments because why bother fighting it? I mean, the person had a positive test uh, they're, they're, they, maybe they stayed off work just for the quarantine period, but they had no symptoms, they were feeling fine, they came back to work, everything's great. Um, uh, so other than the two weeks of quarantine time that they got from their employer, which is state, you know, from, from as required by the state, they, they're great, they're back to work, there's no TV, there's no need for medical treatment. But some of those could and will, will turn into long COVID claims. The um, WCIRB reported that many COVID deaths aren't actually reported until after the employee dies and that there may be a significant number more to come in the workers' compensation system. So what that means is that employers may not even learn that an employee had COVID-19 um, until after the, a lawyer comes in representing the family on a dependency claim. So th that, that death, unfortunately, is another long-term or long COVID consequence. In addition to these severe symptoms, it can lead all the way to uh, death and the employer may not know about it until uh, long after um, uh, the, the, the initial positive test. So what's the time frame on a long tail or long COVID claim? How long does an employee or the employee's attorney have to circle back to the employer and pursue workers' compensation benefits uh, on the grounds that the employee passed away because of COVID-19, their COVID-19 infection, or had become severely ill or developed long-term permanent consequences from this COVID infection. Generally speaking, uh, employees with an accepted COVID injury, an accepted COVID claim, um, or one that was not timely denied, uh, who believe that they've gotten worse have up to a year to file an application at the WCAB. It's a year technically from the date of injury, from the last payment of benefits, whichever is later. And that's under labor code section 5405. So if you think about it, I mean, a lot of these, we're still within the year 
uh, from a lot of when, when the COVID claims actually started, looking, if you, we go back to our chart at the beginning, really the COVID claims didn't even start until you know, April of 2020. So we're still within that year time frame for uh, folks who maybe back in April of 2020 had a minor COVID claim that was accepted by the employer or not timely denied. Uh, and now they feel like you know, they've got long going, uh, long-term consequences they see an attorney about it, and the attorney it can legally file an application and actively pursue that case, request a QME, start the whole process. Uh, similarly, a COVID dependency claim, that is by death claim, uh, applications can be filed up to a year after the employee dies. So basically, we're looking at a time frame of about a year to pursue these long COVID claims. Uh, by the way, if the claim was stipulated, some employers are looking at some of these minor COVID claims. They are stipulating to injury and maybe 0% permanent disability. Um, and you know, putting, putting that stipulation away in, in, in a dark room and hoping it, go, it never comes back. Those employees have up to five years from the date of injury to petition to reopen that case and allege that their condition has gotten worse. So that one, that, that's a whole, that's a five year time frame to allege that their originally zero symptom or low symptom COVID um, infection became a long tail or long haul claim with long-term consequences. What are those long-term symptoms? Coughing, ongoing, sometimes debilitating fatigue. That's a big one. Body aches, joint pain, shortness of breath. And of course the loss of taste and smell that we, um, we've heard so much about with regard to this il illness. Other symptoms include difficulty sleeping, headaches, and brain fog. And all these long-term symptoms translate into some rateable permanent disability. Um, some, of that long, some of that rateable permanent disability is quite minor. For example, loss in taste of smell is mi minor rating. Um, but others can be very, very significant, especially where it affects fatigue, brain fog, you know, ability to, to use cognitive function. So uh, just as an example of a long tail or long-term uh, COVID risk, um, this is a hypothetical. So let's say that you have uh, an employee who complains of shortness of breath or and brain fog fatigue. This is a 40-year-old building inspector. Maybe this 40-year-old building inspector had um, a positive test, uh, but little or no symptoms. The employer accepted the injury. Um, he came back to work, everything was fine. Almost a year later, he starts to develop shortness of breath. He starts to develop brain fog and fatigue. He sees uh, an 800 number in a, a, for an applicant's attorney's firm um, and uh, calls somebody and says, you know, I, I, had, I, have all, I have these symptoms, I'm not sure why. Did you have COVID in the last, uh, at any point? Yes, I did, and I had a claim with my employer. Well, now they can file their application and, and, and add in list all these body, body parts, or the, the, the lungs, they can list the you know, brain, uh, and, and pursue this. So under the AMA guides, uh, hypothetically, if this, if this employee is evaluated by a pulmonologist and it's found that he has a 20% loss of lung capacity, uh, which is attributed to the COVID, um, and a different doctor, let's say a different QME, and by the way, these QMEs have become more expensive as of today, under the new fee schedule, uh, the maybe the neuropsychologist or neuro, neurology QME uh, finds that the person has a mild impact on daytime, daytime alertness, right? So we have an employee who has a 20% loss of lung capacity and mild impact on daytime alertness. So this is a long, long COVID claim, but it's a relatively moderate or mild long COVID claim. We're not talking about somebody who's bedridden. We're just talking about someone who has some minor consequence or moderate consequences. But you'll see the rating for this um, loss of uh, uh, lung capacity rates out to 25%. And the rating for mild impact on daytime alertness rates out to 36% for this employee. And when you combine them, it could be either 52 or 61% rating. And you'll see those, those can pay, uh, pay up to $104,000 in permanent disability. So, what we thought was a minor COVID claim 
could turn into a pretty major COVID claim. The Wall Street Journal reports that some of these COVID long haulers report brain fog, communication difficulties, and an inability to hold down a full-time job. So for those of you paying attention, <laughs> which is all of you, I'm sure, inability to hold down a full-time job is very significant in workers' compensation contexts. Um, the journal reported that many COVID survivors who suffer chronic fatigue, dizziness, and other symptoms have a diminished capacity to work. It's almost like it was, this article was written by an applicant attorney because diminished capacity to work and inability to hold down full-time jobs or actual weightable factors, uh, vocational factors that can be considered by a workers' comp judge in making an award. And, and in fact, it, there's pretty there's extensive case law saying that an inability to hold down a full-time job or a substantial di diminished capacity to work uh, approaching 100% can equate to 100% permanent total disability. And now that same 40-year-old building inspector has a lifetime permanent total disability award for the present value of $3.6 million. So it's, it's a, you know, hopefully this is a rare instance, but realistic. So what, what, how do we control for this? Well, the way to control for this, first of all, is to make sure that if a COVID claim is deniable or if it should be denied, it is denied and done so in a timely manner. Because if the claim is denied at the outset, um, then the statute of limitations will run after that year, which means that the employee or their attorney could not file an application after that point to adjudicate it. It would be barred by the statute of limitations. And it also means that you preserve that defense of AOE, COE, uh, if the case does become litigated in the long run. Because uh, basically, if, if you have a long-term or long-haul COVID claim and it's accepted, and, and later on they develop all these symptoms, then really all that we're fighting over is the extent of disability. There's no more fighting over AOE, COE. You can't use that as a bargaining or litigation tactic. Um, if the claim is denied, even if the person becomes a long haul claim, we preserve that AOE, COE defense. We can raise it later on and we can maybe even win outright in the case. In fact, I'd say that our chances of winning these cases are pretty good given uh, the state of California law. Let's take a look at some of that California law right now and see what I'm talking about. Can employers deny a COVID claim? Yes. Um, the, the California Supreme Court has visited this topic many, many, many times in the past. Literally, there's case law going back 100 years talking about uh, occupational diseases and uh, contagious diseases in the workplace and, the, uh, and outside the workplace, of course. And the California Supreme Court has stated that the fact that an employee uh, contracts a disease while employed or becomes disabled from the natural prog progression of a non-industrial disease, which is what COVID is, during employment will not establish a causal connection. And they went on in another case to say, additionally, an ailment does not become an occupational disease simply because it was contracted on the employer's premises. That's pretty significant stuff coming from the California Supreme Court. Um, and so what's, what's the difference between an occupational disease and a non-occupational disease? An occupational disease is something like asbestosis, where you have an employee who is working with asbestos. Nobody does, really, not very few people do that anymore in, in, the, in its day. There were a lot of people that worked with asbestos on a day-to-day -day basis, and those people developed asbestosis. That's an occupational disease. There are some people who are exposed to certain dangerous chemicals in their job and they develop a certain disease as a consequence of that exposure. That's an occupational disease. But COVID-19 is not an occupational disease. It is not a product of any particular employment. It is everywhere, right? It's at the grocery store. Um, so COVID-19 is one of these non-occupational diseases. It may be contracted at work. It may be contracted off work. Um, generally speaking, uh, if the uh, consensus among scientists and, and epidemiologists is that it's far more likely to be contracted in a social setting, especially an intimate social setting, with family and friends all gathered together in the indoor spaces, um, inside a bar when people are, you know, having too much to drink and hugging on each other. That's particularly dangerous. But workplace is actually not that uh, contagious among the list of places uh, that a person goes to every day. 
as far as diseases go. So this is definitely a non-occupational disease and the California courts are skeptical of whether those are compensable historically. Um, so how do we put this into context of COVID claims and, and different, and uh, you know, when, it, when a COVID claim walks in the door, what does this mean? So in California, most of the jobs that are high risk are covered by a presumption. This is important to remember because it, what it means is it's sort of like short, it's a shortcut in our analysis of these COVID claims. Um, this pyramid here comes from the OSHA and uh, US OSHA. They developed this pyramid and it basically kind of demonstrates um, the types of jobs that exist in the, in the, in the United States relative to their COVID-19 risk, their, their risk of contracting COVID at work as opposed to off work. And you'll see most jobs in the US are low risk. So there's a low risk that um, a person will contract COVID while doing their job. For example, here I am sitting in my home office <laughs> doing a webinar as part of my job. And there's no one else in the room with me, uh, certainly no coworkers. So I'd say my risk of contracting COVID-19 and doing my job today is pretty much approaches zero. Um, so definitely gonna be in the blue at the bottom there. Some jobs get more risky, right? Uh, and the very high risk jobs, such as uh, nurses and doctors and EMTs working directly with known COVID patients, those folks have very high risk of contracting COVID-19 at their workplace. And as it so happens, those folks are also covered by a statutory presumption. In California, folks who are, who are at very high risk and even at high risk, most of those folks are already covered by a statutory presumption according to uh, uh, California law and the OSHA regulations. So what that tells us is that if you have a uh, claim that walks in the door and you know it's covered by a presumption, it could be the outbreak presumption, it could be a uh, job classification presumption, we, they, we know that those folks are at high risk or very high risk. If they're not covered by a presumption, then their job is probably medium or low risk. So that's helpful to know because when your claim is non-presumptive, it means that the employee's work was unlikely to have been the cause of their COVID-19, which brings us back to our California cases. If the workplace is unlikely to have been the cause, um, it's not compensable. So non-presumptive claims are inherently low risk or at least medium risk um, under California law. Absent the presumption, if the employee contracts COVID-19 while employed during employment, that alone will not establish a causal connection. That's what the California Supreme Court says. So absent extraordinary circumstances in a particular workplace, it's anyone's guess where and when an employee contracted the disease. Was it at home? Was it at work? Was it during their commute? So how do you deny a non-presumptive COVID claim? Absent a presumption, um, it is the claimant's burden of proof by reasonable medical probability to show that the disease was transmitted to them while working their medium or low risk job, right? Because we know if it's not presumptive, it's a medium or low risk job, as opposed to any social or off work setting that they may have been exposed to. So it could be the grocery store, it could be anywhere else. They, the employee has the burden of proving that. And that is a very hard thing to do for a doctor to establish credibly where a particular individual contracted COVID-19 or the flu or a cold, right? It's anyone's guess where that, where, where what one day, what one minute, one, one interaction was the cause of a particular infection. So in short, because the risks of a minor claim turning into a long haul case, our recommendation is if a presumption does not apply, the claim probably can and should be denied because you're, it's not so much that you wanna control for these minor COVID claims that are non-presumptive by denying them, it's that you want to eliminate the risk of the long haul, the long-term COVID claims. Here's some denial language that um, we've taken from interactions with many, many clients that we've talked to about this and we've offered. Um, I like this language, I think it, it kind of hits all the bases and explains to the employee, I think, in uh, you know, clear terms that this is you know, nothing personal, but this is a community-borne community disease and uh, your, your risk of it happening at work was, 
was mild compared to it happening anywhere else. Um, and you, you don't need to write this down. It'll be on the PDF, which will be available. So you'll have it there to refer back to. But here's, we like this language and it seems to work for a lot of our employer clients. So what do we do if a presumption applies? Now we know a presumption sort of, as our little picture tells us, changes the uh, weight on the scales of justice. Uh, presumption puts the burden of proof on the employer. Can the employer overcome that burden of proof? So briefly, presumption laws nationally, there are 21 states that have adopted the COVID presumptions through legislative action, governor's orders or agency rules. Uh, they vary in, in their scope and intensity. Um, and so do the claim denial rates. No state has linked uh, workers' compensation claims to OSHA safety violations. So no state has said, if, if you have an OSHA citation, then that, um, and somebody gets COVID as a, as, during the relevant period of that citation, then it's a presumed COVID claim. But California and Illinois allow for the inverse, which we wanna talk about. They allow for rebuttal of the virus uh, claim if the company or agency followed disease prevention protocols. That's in the presumption uh, 3212.88 presumption itself. So California and Illinois, their laws, their presumption laws link OSHA to the workers' compensation presumption. That's important. We'll come back to, we'll talk about that. Just a brief reminder of the California presumption laws. I know you all know these now, so I'm not going to go over them. Um, but mostly what we're talking about is 3212.87, which is the safety officer and healthcare presumption, and 3212.88, which is the outbreak presumption. So what if a legal presumption applies to a claim? What do we do with it? If a legal presumption applies generally, and these are, this is for all presumptions, it shifts the burden of proof to the employer to show that the disease was more likely not transmitted to the employee while working and was instead more likely contracted in a social or off work setting. So as I mentioned earlier, the, in a non-presumptive case, it's almost impossible for an employee to prove that they contracted the disease at work. Um, I mean, it's conceivable they can do that. And I'm sure that there are QMEs out there who will, who will be happy to render that opinion, but legally it's an uphill battle. Similarly, the presumption creates an uphill battle for employers because we have to now prove that the disease was more likely contracted or definitively was contracted somewhere outside of work. Um, so if the presumption does apply, the claim probably should be accepted if the employer does nothing to rebut the presumption. So two cases walk in the door, you know, briefly investigated, one's presumed compensable, one's not. The presumed compensable claim, if the employer really chooses to do not much about it, not much, doesn't choose to look into it, it has to be accepted because that's what the law states. Um, here's our quick reminder about the, the two presumption statutes that we're talking about here, outbreak presumption and the healthcare presumption. The outbreak presumption specifically identifies relevant evidence to rebut the presumption, whereas the healthcare presumption doesn't specifically refer to those um, remedial measures under uh, as, a, as a basis for rebuttal, but it does say that the statute is rebuttable. And I think that a similar analysis can be used for either presumption. Uh, this is what exactly what 3212.88 says. It says evidence relevant to controverting the presumption may include, but is not limited to, evidence of measures in place to reduce potential transmission of COVID-19 in the employee's place of employment and evidence of an employee's non-occupational risks of COVID-19 infection. As attorneys, what Chantal and I like, we like to see the statute tell the judge, not us, the judge, <laughs> judge, this, this is relevant evidence to rebut this presumption because it makes it um, our jobs you know, easier when we come forward with that evidence because we're pointing right to the statute that says this is evidence used that can be used to rebut the presumption. That's what the legislature intended. Okay, so presumption claim denial criteria. If the presumption does apply, the presumption can be still be rebutted and the claim can still be denied if the employer has good remedial measures in place at the time of the alleged exposure. Comes right from the statute. 
and there was sufficient, there was insufficient exposure at work to COVID, not to a COVID-19 case, or there was a known contemporaneous non-work risk. So this is our cheat sheet, if you will, or cliff notes on, on presumptive claim denials. This is what you need to deny a presumptive claim. And let's go back to the statute. The um, evidence can includes measures in place to reduce potential exposure of the transmission of COVID-19. Okay, so that's the good remedial measures in place. And the statute says uh, reduce potential transmission. So that's exposure. And of course it says non-occupational risks. So that's where the, this is exactly where this comes from. So we wanna be able to show that the employer did what it could, needed to do to reduce transmission at work. And then we need to, we need something, one more thing. We need to either be able to show that there was a non-work risk, which is more likely the cause, or for that particular employee, or that the employee's exposure, the actual time that they were at work exposed to someone else with COVID-19 was not sufficient to explain the, the contraction of that disease. That's our evidence. So what, what in the heck are these remedial measures and what is this exposure when we use these terms? Well, Cal OSHA has been kind enough to, to define those terms for us um, in their regulations, these much hated regulations. Um, no, the, the regulations which briefly I'll, I'll review, um, remedial measures under Cal OSHA includes drafting a COVID-19 prevention program, providing employee training, et cetera, et cetera, um, investigating COVID-19 cases, requiring the physical distancing and mask wearing, and ventilation and quarantining, um, all of the stuff that we're used to from these Cal OSHA regulations and that all employers are probably complying with, or most employers. There are some COVID cite, uh, citations being issued by Cal OSHA, but for the most part, employers are doing a lot to try to comply with these uh, Cal OSHA regulations. There's also record keeping requirements as part of the Cal OSHA regulations, and that becomes important in the claims process, um, where we have to, where the employers have to keep a record of all of these, what's going on at work, what they're doing to establish these remedial measures and enforce them in the workplace. All of that is helpful on the claims side. So remedial measures and workers comp. How do those two fit together? Did the employer have these measures in place at the time of the alleged injury and can we prove it? Um, the good news is there may be sufficient proof via these same record keeping and reporting obligations required under OSHA. Um, so the first place I'm gonna go if I have a, a COVID-19 well, where I do go when, I have my, when I'm looking at my COVID claims is what has the employer done what record keeping has the employer done to comply with the Cal OSHA regs? If I, get, I would love to get a copy of the, um, the COVID-19 prevention program that the employer had in place, training that was done, uh, ideally a sign-in sheet or some other electronic confirmation that the employee attended that uh, COVID-19 training that the employer put on, um, you know, Photographs of the posters being in the workplace showing, you know, wear your mask, stay six feet apart. Great stuff. That evidence that you need to comply with the Cal OSHA regulations is great evidence on the workers' comp side to prove that the employer had remedial measures in place. So what is exposure? What is COVID-19 exposure? How is that defined? How do we know if an employee has had, so we know what the remedial measures are, we know how to identify them and define them. Um, what is this exposure or, or, uh, that, that is also referenced? What, what, what's sufficient exposure in the workplace to uh, tell us that someone may have contracted COVID-19? So Cal OSHA also defines that as being within six feet of a COVID-19 case, that's their term, um, which is mostly defined as a positive tested person for a cumulative of 15 minutes or greater in a 24 hour period. Uh, overlapping with the quote, high risk exposure period as defined by the Section 3205. So this is what Cal OSHA defines as sufficient COVID-19 exposure. This, this means that, that for there to be sufficient exposure at work, the claimant 
and another and a positive tested coworker have to be within six feet of each other for more than 15 minutes, cumulative, in a 24 hour period. And it has to be within that COVID coworkers high risk exposure period. What is the high risk exposure period? What does that mean? So for persons who develop and this, again, this all comes from OSHA, for persons who develop COVID-19 symptoms from two days before they first developed the symptoms until 10 days after the symptoms first appeared, 24 hours have passed with no fever, without use of fever reducing medications and symptoms have improved, or uh, for persons who test positive and never develop symptoms two days before and 10 days after the specimen of the positive test for COVID-19 was collected. So this is what, the, what OSHA defines as the um, uh, high risk exposure period. So just going back here, 15 minutes or greater in a 24 hour period overlapping with the high risk exposure period. So for the person who had, uh, if, if they were exposed to a coworker, your claimant for more than 15 minutes in a 24 hour period, and that coworker had tested positive for COVID-19, so they were a COVID case, but they were already out of this 10 day time frame. maybe it was day 11 of the time frame. Uh, when they first uh, had the positive test, then that is not exposure in the high risk exposure period. This is, these are the terms and the actual, you know, the details we, want, we can look at to rebut a uh, presumed compensable COVID-19 claim. We can prove the employer had remedial measures in place, and we can prove that the employee did not have sufficient exposure at work to account for the COVID-19. That's a basis to rebut the presumption. Another basis, uh, so, so is Kalusha your friend? Yes, in that sense, because the idea Kalusha has defined exposure, remedial measures, and high risk exposure period for us. Uh, th those terms are not defined in 1159 or 8685, but OSHA's definitions should apply because that's the way the California law and all, all really works, is when you're looking at terminology on the same subject matter that's defined in one statute, um, you can translate that definition over to the other statute. So, uh, so it also helps to show that the employer has not been cited for OSHA, by OSHA inspectors for a violation in that place of employment. That's another fact that I would love to be able to present or will pre do present, will be presenting. We haven't gone to trial yet on one of these, but there's a couple coming up. Is uh, an employer witness who can testify, no, there was never an OSHA citation for COVID-19 violation in the building, uh, agricultural field, or other location where that employee, employee worked, that place of employment. That's a great fact for us because it says that, um, in fact, our remedial measures are working, at least according to OSHA inspectors. Uh, on the flip side of that, if the employer has been cited by OSHA for a COVID-19 violation and the citation is relevant to that of claimant's place of employment or relevant uh, within the time frame that the claimant developed COVID-19, and we are looking at an outbreak consumption case, that claim probably has to be accepted because you have a COVID, you have an OSHA citation that will certainly be referred to by uh, the applicant's attorney that may actually even create exposure for a serious and willful misconduct claim, which we'll save for another day. So here's a recap of presumption denial um, of COVID claims. If the presumption does apply, the presumption can and still be rebutted and the claim can still be denied if the employer has was compliant with the OSHA regulations at the time of the alleged exposure, i.e. remedial measures were in place, and there was insufficient exposure at work uh, to a COVID case. Uh, within six feet or 15 minutes or more in the 24 hour period uh, with, with during the high risk exposure period for that uh, COVID-19 case. The other basis to rebut the presumption when you have those remedial measures in place, even if you can't prove um, that there was not sufficient exposure, that's, it's kind of hard to track all that and, they, and verify it all. Even if you can't prove that, the claim can still be denied if there was a, if there was a contemporaneous non-work risk. So what are, because that's right out of the statute. What is a contemporaneous non-work risk? Well, there's a whole bunch. And 
So these are these, these come from some of our deposition questions that we ask in uh, COVID-19 cases. Potential exposures away from work within the 14 days prior to the positive test result are relevant um, because that is the time frame where uh, COVID-19 contraction can occur prior to a positive test uh, and still be relevant. Um, so our members are, are other members of the household infected. That turns out to be one of the top reasons why people get COVID-19 is because a loved one or a roommate or a housemate um, was also infected. Why? Because they're in close quarters with each other. They're sharing a bathroom, or they're sharing kitchen utensils, or they're sharing uh, you know, reading space. So they're sitting on the same couch together watching TV for hours on end. That's high exposure. Um, and so that's, that's incredibly relevant. Uh, does, does the employee have other jobs or other employers? That's an important one not to overlook. Even a part-time, if they're working part-time as a bartender and, and you know, work for you as a, as a, as a government clerk, um, it's far more likely they, they encounter that exposure working in a bar as a, in that other capacity. Um, other significant others or, or friends who were infected, people who they may not live with, but who, who they come into social interaction with. Have they traveled or taken public transportation? Other high-risk exposure, high-risk activities. Uh, do they go shopping and how often and where? Uh, do they exercise outside the home? Where and when? Uh, do they attend any group activity with two or more people in it uh, outside of their household? Uh, do they go into restaurants or uh, pick up fast food? So those, those are some of the things that, that should be part of that initial claims review of a COVID claim, even a presumptive COVID claim, like an outbreak claim. And if there is relevant, contemporaneous non-work exposure, those claims can be denied. Because again, because the long haul or long-term COVID risk, um, it's worth considering denying those claims. So here's a presumption denial language. Um, earlier, I showed you a slide with uh, non-presumptive denial language. This is a preferred language if there is a pre presumption, generally an outright presumption. We, this is an example. Um, we still talk about the risks of COVID-19 being common to the general public, um, but we also want to mention that there are remedial measures in place at the time of the alleged exposure to prevent transmission. Of course, we want that statement to be true. Uh, and further, you, do not, you did not have sufficient cumulative exposure at work uh, to, co to a COVID-19 case. It comes right out of the Cal OSHA regs and right out of the statute. Or you say you had a known non-work COVID exposure to a housemaid or whoever. And then we, we also want, want to say, if, there's, if they have not produced a uh, treating physician's report or a QB report that says that the injury resulted from work, uh, that the illness resulted from work, um, that's also a basis for denial. And I would throw that in as well. And the time frame of denying these cases, cases is so short, it's very likely there is no, certainly no QB report probably not even a treating report that does any kind of analysis as to where the disease was contracted. So that's worth saying as well. The, let's talk about those time limits. The denial time limit, uh, the time to act on an outbreak presumption is only 45 days. Uh, and, the, and the time frame to deny a claim for with the healthcare or public safety presumption is only 30 days. So that's a really short time frame uh, to get those denials out. If they are not denied within those time frames, they are presumed compensable. But independent of the outbreak presumption or independent of the healthcare safety officer presumption, they're presumed compensable anyway if they're not denied in a timely fashion. This is much shorter than the usual 90-day time frame to deny, say, a knee injury claim or a psych injury claim. So that's the summary of really the meat potatoes of denying these COVID claims and the risk of long haul and long-term claims. I wanna just briefly mention SB 685 in the context of these same OSHA regulations that we just, just talked about. Um, so 685 is the statute that creates this notice requirement for employers when they have had a, a COVID case on their premises, they have to send within one business day, notice to union representatives, employees, and so on. Um, if those people have been exposed to a qualifying individual at the work location. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because there's that word exposed again. And 
the statute 685 does define a qualifying individual, but doesn't really define exposed. They don't define what that means. So again, we can look to the Cal OSHA regs to tell us what is sufficient exposure. And so we know six feet, 15 minutes or more within a 24 hour period during someone during the qualifying individual's high risk period. So that, um, that exposure definition comes in handy for these uh, notice requirements as well and can help to find for employers when they actually have to send out those notice requirements under AD 685. Um, now 685, again, one of the differences is um, under uh, the OSHA regs, we talk about a COVID case, but 685 has a different definition of uh, the, the, the subject of the notice qualifying individual is separately defined. So we want to stick with that definition under 685. And it defines it. It's a similar definition to a COVID case under OSHA. Um, of course, it includes similarly, a, somebody with a laboratory confirmed uh, COVID-19 uh, positive test. But this can also include someone with a diagnosis for COVID-19, but not an actual test result. Or if they're under a COVID-19 related order to isolate by a public health official, or they died because of COVID-19. Those are all considered to be a qualifying individual. Okay, last topic before we get to some questions. Um, liability and co-employment. Um, one of the other risks of these long-term long COVID claims is that there is some potential exposure for third-party business liability for COVID claims because COVID-19 is, again, easily transmitted and if you have a claim that is accepted or presumed compensable, um, the uh, person goes off and, and that the employee goes off and infects other people. Those other people potentially have third party claims uh, against the employer. I have a whole PowerPoint on just that topic, but we won't go into all of it. But just to say that this is yet another reason to look at these uh, COVID claims very carefully. Um, and just lastly, a word about general special employment. It is allowed for when you have these uh, general and special employer, oftentimes in the construction sites and in other contexts, to um, designate a particular employee who has the workers' comp coverage. This is another good reason, COVID-19, to make sure that in those contracts you are designating who has the workers' comp coverage, um, and that will be relevant on who is going to cover these COVID claims, including long-term claims. So take a look at those contracts for those employers who have that overlapping employment relationship. Okay, ah, that was good. So um, I'm going to turn over back over to Sean's Hall. Thanks, Tom. Um, so we have, we didn't have any questions submitted through the chat. If anyone has any, they can submit those now um, and we can get those answered. And if you think of your question later, <laughs> you're so overwhelmed with information and it doesn't, it takes a little while to digest, totally understandable. Um, Feel free uh, to email us, right, Chantal? Yes, uh, you can email us at um, your local office, at any of the email addresses on the screen. Also, um, you can go to our website where we have blog posts about these topics, and we will blog um, when this gets posted to our website so you can view the webinar again or share it with friends if you want. And then also, we know the QME regs just got changed as of today. We do have a blog post on that posted as well. And we will be doing a webinar similar to this one about the changes to the QME fee schedule. Um, I, I don't have any questions. So um, okay. thank you well, all for attending. Yeah, we're right on time. Thanks everyone for coming today. We appreciate it. And we'll see you around. Good luck to you all. Please stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you.